Hi, it's Lindley Oz and welcome to another episode of Truth Hunters because then you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So tonight's message is going to conclude the end times arc series I have been doing, all of which are leading us up to the opening of the seals. So this is the last one of the end times arc and wow, it has got some absolutely amazing information and it wait until you see it. So I reveal to you about the chambers, the bride and the bridegroom coming out of the chambers, the heart, how it relates to the heart being the temple of God and wait. I also will reveal to you the tree of life and how it relates to the end times and the tribulation and the heart. It's all so absolutely amazing. So I hope that you will watch the entire message and that you will really pay attention and that you will share this message with your friends and your family. Share it, get these messages out. It is so important. So just a quick reminder, I don't wanna keep you too long here. I wanna to get to the message, but I am mostly 100% viewer supported. So if these messages bless you or you feel led or moved to support this ministry, you can do so via my PayPal or my PO box. The information is on the screen and beneath the video in the video description. It's also on my website, truthhuntersshow.com. Again, that's truthhuntersshow.com. Please don't forget to go and subscribe to my website so that you will receive all of my updates. I will let you know I am behind on posting on my website. I will get caught up here soon. I have had to move. Please watch another video I have. I'll try to link it below um, to find out why I had to move. So I was moving for a month. So I'm very behind. I will get caught up on my website. However, go to truthhuntershow.com and subscribe. I do not send out spam advertisements. I don't overpost. Obviously, I'm behind right now. So you won't get too many emails. And also don't forget to download the free app for my free show available to you on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and a free app for any Android or Apple device, Truth Hunters. Again, the app is free. The show is free. So make sure that you go and download the app. I post everything on my TV platform at least a day or two in advance and posting it on YouTube or Rumble. I'm also on Rumble. So go to Rumble and search not videos. I believe it is channels or playlist truth hunters show. Now there are two of me. They are both me, but you want to subscribe to the one that has the most subscribers. That is the correct one to subscribe to. Again, that's on rumble. Thank you to all of you who have been faithfully supporting this ministry. Your financial support of this ministry is greatly appreciated. I could not do this without you. This is my full-time ministry. This is what God has me doing. And so I rely on your gifts to this ministry in order to continue sharing the truth with people all over the world and what a blessing it is. So financial support has been way down here lately. I don't know if it's because I wasn't uploading much for a month because I was moving mostly by myself um, with the exception of some of my furniture, furniture and things like that. Movers helped do that, but everything else I did by myself. And it was really, really stressful. So I don't know if it's that or what's going on. Maybe people don't like to hear the truth and they get offended. I don't know. So please consider supporting this ministry, pray about it. And I'm asking everyone to help out in a different way. This is a way all of you can help out. And I rely on you guys to share these messages because I am censored so heavily. So share these messages all over the place. So people will hear the truth. I rely on that. And thank you so much to those of you who have been sharing these messages all over the place. God bless you for that. All right. So that's about all I have to say. And I want to make sure that you go ahead and have time to listen to this awesome, awesome message. 
that's going to open your eyes and reveal some things to you that more than likely you didn't even know. You're going to see how everything ties together into the end times, even going back to the book of Genesis. And I'm going to show you that. And I'm so excited for you to know the truth and to have your eyes opened. And don't forget, it is so important for you to know the truth of God's word, the absolute truth for yourself, because as it is written, then you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So tonight we're going to start first reviewing some verses about the, the bridegroom coming out of the chambers. You know, we've talked about the heart. There's a few verses there, but then I have a very interesting bit to um, to show you guys to do with the rivers that are in Genesis chapter two. So we're going to go over that and the word meanings and the same rivers also appear in revelation chapter five, as well as, or no, maybe it's revelation chapter four, sorry, revelation four and also revelation 22. So we're going to take a look at that. And I think there's a lot more depth to it than what I have even begun to find yet. So, um, I think it merits a little further studying and research, but we can at least find out some very interesting information. So let's go ahead and say a prayer. Um, does anybody have any, uh, quick prayer requests before I say the prayer? All right. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we just thank you and praise you for this time together and ask that you would just lead this discussion, lead this study and open our hearts and our minds to receive what you would have us to receive from this teaching. Lord, we just thank you and praise you that you just continue strengthening us in areas where we are weak, that we know the enemy is going to present things to us in our lives, Lord, to try to lure us into a trap, Father to try to lure us back into the flesh. And Lord, we know this is the time of the judgment of the house of God. So we know he's going to try harder than ever. So Lord, I just thank you and praise you that you give us all strength. And Lord, when we sin, convict us in our hearts, reveal any hidden sins to us as well. Heavenly father, Lord, we just thank you. We praise you that you just continue giving us all peace, even in the midst of trial and tribulation in our own lives, give us all peace. And Lord, I just pray that the only fear that any of us have is the fear of you. Your word tells us over and over to fear God and God alone and nothing else. So help us to walk in the fear of the Lord at all times, Lord, trembling at the mere thought of our own sins and sinning where that we would repent for them. Thank you and praise you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And amen. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and begin. I'm going to share my screen with you. It's the notes. So we're going to start off with the chambers of the heart. Now, hopefully, this will probably be the end of this particular teaching, and then we can get back into Revelation. We'll see how it goes. If it's not the last of it tonight, it'll definitely be done by next Monday, but I'm thinking we'll get through it. Okay. So we stopped before with the lineage of Adam and we discussed how it reveals the order of events in the tribulation. And that was very interesting. And then of course, Noah rest. I've also discussed with you. And again, we're going to do a study on that sometime. So just be patient. But um, Genesis, you know, God says, I have revealed or declared the end from the beginning. And lo and behold, the seven days of creation in a second fold, when you do a word study, are also the seven years of tribulation. And I'll give you an example in case some of you are here today that weren't here last week. An example of that is we know expanse and Genesis is referring to the arch in the sky However, expanse also means pounding out, beating out, hammering out, which represents God's judgment. The word create, for example, in Hebrew means bara, and I'm probably mispronouncing that. I'm sure bara means to make something out of nothing, but it also means to cut down. 
So that will be a very interesting study when we get to that. So like I said, it's very interesting. The seventh day is the day of rest. And Noah here, his name means rest to be finished. It is done. All right. So a little bit of recap from last week. Now we're going to move on along. We never got to Noah's son's names. Shem, okay, means name, definite and conspicuous position, and appellation as a mark or memorial of individuality, honor, authority, character, renown, report, reputation, fame, glory, the name as designated by God, memorial, monument, perhaps rather from Strong's Hebrew 7760 to place, to set, appoint, direct, extend compassion, figurative to set, ordain, establish, found, appoint, make, determine, fix, station, set in place, plant, transform into, to set or make for a sign to be set. Now we're going to find out as we review the remaining two names that more than likely the name Shem here is referring to the mark of the beast, which is known as a monument, a memorial, a mark. The name Ham means hot from a tropical habitat or hot. It means hot, warm, to be hot, literally or figuratively, inflame self, which would be referring to pride, get, have, heat, be, or wax warm, to be or grow warm, to become aroused, inflame to warm oneself. Japheth means expansion from Strong's Hebrew 6601 to open, make roomy, or in a sinister sense, delude, deceive, allure, entice, flatter, persuade, silly one, to be open, to be wide, to make spacious, to make open, to be open-minded, simple, naive, to be deceived, to be persuaded. So this would kind of, to me, be just an overview, a basic overview. So we went through the different names of Adam's lineage, and it went in order of every event to do with the tribulation, including um, the mark of the beast and the fire of God. See missile attack on the screen there. Now here's just a brief overview. We have here something that I feel according to the definitions of the words Shem referring to a mark, like the mark of the beast or a memorial or a monument. It says mark or memorial, et cetera, et cetera, to set or ordain or establish. And then you have Ham referring to something that's very hot and also referring to pride. That reminds me of the unpardonable sin, which, you know, is blaspheming the Holy spirit or taking the mark, which are things, which you cannot be forgiven for. Okay. Remember the tribulation is the dividing, the separating from the wheat, from the tares and all of those things, the divorcement, the bill of divorcement, where when you get into finally the wrath of God at three and a half year, the three and a half year point, the decision has been made. All right. So then you have Japheth, which means to be naive, to be deceived and persuaded. So it's kind of a quick look to me of the mark people basically making their decision to spend eternity in hell and then being deceived into taking the mark. That's how I see those three names and the meanings of them given especially they follow through in the same passage after the lineage of Adam. All right. So now we're going to go into the chambers of the heart. The groom is coming out of his chambers. We have discussed within this study going months, I don't know, over a month ago now, several months back, we have discussed the human heart being the, um, the dwelling place of the Lord. Okay, we, we discussed about the rib cage, the walls of the temple, the lungs and the breath represent our spirit, where our spirit abides. The heart is defined in Hebrew as the seat of the will, the seat of the desire, the seat of emotions, things point to the heart and the chambers of the heart. And we know that in the Old Testament, 
they carried the spirit of God in a chest that was overlaid with gold. And now God, his spirit rather dwells in our chest. And there is also gold, which I revealed to you scientifically. They discovered gold in our bodies and discovered the reason for it was because we have various organs such as the human heart and even our brain that operate on electrical impulses. Now your heart does have a type of brain. It is called cellular memory. It is more powerful than the brain in your head and actually has more effects and control over your entire body than the brain in your head does. So when you see the word, the thoughts of the heart in the Bible, that is literal. You actually science discovered it. You can do some research on it. They, they discovered this because heart transplant patients began taking on personality traits, likes and dislikes of their donors. So it's a very interesting thing. The human heart is in the name or the shape of the name of God, the sheen, which I've now shown you in several studies. So I just want you to remember that as we go through this and look at these verses. And also when we get down to the four rivers from Genesis two, I want you to remember what I shared with you about the gold. All right. First verse we're looking at is Psalm chapter 19 verses one through six. I'm sharing them with you from the new American standard Bible translation. The heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Remember in the second fold expanse is referring to pounding out, beating out, hammering out judgment day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. Now who came during the day? The word Jesus. What is night referring to night oftentimes in the Bible is referring to the time of tribulation. Jesus, the word came, the word was spoken when he came during the day, the beginning of the church, the early church, the time of Jesus is referred to as the day. The end is referred to as the night night to night reveals knowledge. God is revealing knowledge, hidden knowledge, things hidden since the foundations of the earth to his people. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all of the earth and their utterances to the end of the world. Let me pause there. There's a verse in the Bible that talks about a famine for hearing the truth, a famine for hearing the truth. Now, the famine for hearing the truth does not just mean that there aren't people sharing the truth. And there are very few of us. Most of the teachings you hear about are apostate teachings of some sort. So there is a famine for people that are speaking the truth, but a famine for hearing the truth. The Bible talks about those who have been given ears to hear. The Bible talks about how during the end times, God will send a strong delusion so that they would believe a lie. So you see, there's a famine for hearing of it. People don't have the ears to hear it. They are rejecting the truth of the word of God. So the famine is referring to people who are hearing it, but they are rejecting it. They don't have ears to hear. They choose to remain in ignorance and they choose to believe a lie. All right. So there is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their utterances to the end of the world. And then he has placed a tent for the sun. Remember, we talked about the eagle's wings, the cloud, the tent, the tabernacle of his dwelling, the shadow of the Lord God Almighty, Psalm 91, and I believe Psalm 18 and some others. And then he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. It's rising is from one end of the heavens and it's circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. In other words, all, all flesh 
the church and the wicked will be judged. Of course, the last half of tribulation is his wrath, which is not for his people. It is for the apostates and the wicked. Okay, but all will be judged. Jesus said that everyone would be salted with the fire of God. All right, so notice the circuit. If you remember in Genesis, and this is kind of important to point it out if you want to make a note of it. In Genesis, the order of the curse after Adam and Eve sinned, in which the Lord spoke the curse, was given first to the serpent. The next one that received the curse was Eve. Her curse, interestingly enough, goes along with the woman in Revelation 12. So it was also very prophetic. Her curse was she would have great pain and increase in great pain and labor and childbearing. And then, of course, next you have Adam who got cursed. And some of his curses line up with Jesus. You can see the thorns and the thistles and the bread. But now we know that Adam and Eve both eventually died, but we're looking at it prophetically. It's very interesting that only Adam when God announced the curses was mentioned that to the dust, he would return. Now that's prophetic of Jesus, of course, who had the crown of thorns, ate the bread and by the sweat of his brow. And Jesus also had to return to the dust. He had to die for our sins. But in that order, you have the curse of the serpent, the curse of Eve, and then the curse of the man. Now, moving forward, reverse the curse. So the curse was that mankind went from being made in the image of God and incorruptible to corruptible. So now reverse the curse. Jesus comes. Who was the last to be cursed? Adam, the man. Who was the first in, this, in the New Testament? You have Jesus. He comes. He teaches everyone and ministers gathers you know his disciples and then he lays down his life and ascends rises from his death and then ascends back up to the throne of god who is next in reverse order the woman then you have the woman of revelation 12 and great pain and labor to give birth the woman is also the same person in the bible as the shulamite and also daughter zion you can do a study on that. And maybe sometime we can study that a little more deeper Then who's next. Then you finally have the serpent and you have him basically being cast into the bottomless pit. And then of course you have the thousand years of peace, and then you have him coming back. And then finally, once and for all being destroyed. So the full circle of reversing the curse of sin on humanity, the circuit. All right. Proverbs 7, 24 through 27. Now, therefore, my sons, listen to me and pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. This is referring to the adulteress or in the prophetic to the harlot, the, the adulteress, the, the, the apostasy, the great apostasy. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For many are the victims she has cast down and numerous are all her slain. Her house is the way to Sheol, descending to the chambers of death. So, that's very interesting because we know Jesus talked about the wide gate and the narrow gate. Many will enter through the wide one, which leads to hell, but very few will enter through the narrow gate, which leads to heaven. We see here today, mega churches. We see the overall majority of people who call themselves Christians following after the great apostasy to one degree or another. We see the overall majority of people calling themselves Christians, very deceived and very caught up in the great apostasy, which is very ear tickling and very fleshly. 
the beast of the earth, Revelation 13, the beast of the earth, the beast of the flesh, a religion, man-made religion of the flesh, meant to appeal to the flesh. Psalm 119, 9 through 11. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. With all my heart, I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Jesus is the word and his throne spiritually is in our heart. When you feel alone and you feel like, like maybe God isn't there and he's not listening to you or you're going through something stressful. I want you to remember something. And these aren't just pretty words. And these aren't just words meant for comfort and, and nothing else. This is very real, very real. You can't see your spirit, but you know, you have a spirit. We can, you know, go to the hospital and get an x-ray or, or something and see organs and see various aspects of our flesh, but we can't see our spirit, but our spirit is there. Your spirit dwells in your chest, your lungs, your breath, your spirit. Remember, I just said moments ago, the walls of the temple, the rib cage, the rib cage is very important going back to Genesis and the creation uh, or how God made the woman. It's very important when you go to where Jesus was, you know, pierced in his side, the word side means ribs. And interestingly, the rib, the shape of the rib cage is in the same shape as Noah's Ark, the skeleton of it. It's in the shape of an arch or a bow. Very interesting. So I want you to remember this. There is your spirit and right there with it. In your heart, the spirit of the Lord abides. He is that close to you, one with your very spirit, within your heart, within your breath, within your being. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. Your mind, your heart, your soul, your blood, your life force, it is all there together as one in the Lord. All right, Song of Psalms, chapter one, verse four. Draw me after you and let us run together. The king has brought me into his chambers. You see, when, when you receive Jesus Christ into your heart as your savior, you are one with him. Not only in your, the chambers of your heart, but you are in his heart. You are the pupil of his eye. The, some translations say the apple of his eye, the pupil. You are in his heart with him, the chamber of his heart. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will rejoice in you and be glad. We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly, do they love you? Finally, and then I'll answer any questions real quick if anybody has them before we move on to the tree of life. Joel chapter 2 verses 15 through 16, blow a trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing infants. Let the bridegroom come out of his room and the bride out of her bridal chamber. This is at midpoint right here, this passage with it, what it's talking about. Let the bridegroom come out of his room. The word room, if you look it up in the Hebrew is also the same as chambers and the bride out of her bridal chamber. Remember I talked about the end times arc, I, ARC, and I talked about the praise that's going on and about all of us being plugged in to the heart of God at the same time, thus creating a type of spiritual Holy Spirit, fire and electricity and end times ark. But just like the ark in the Old Testament of Noah floated to safety on water, this end times ark will be a safety and a protection for us in the cloud of God and the shelter of his wings and protection. But for the world, 
for the unsaved, for the apostates and the wicked. It will be the wrath of God. As you can see, the first few things that happen in the wrath of God involve fire. All right, does anybody have any questions or comments real quick before we move on along to the tree of life? All right, the tree of life, the heart of God. The river in Genesis is one river with four rivers flowing out of it. This is the tree of life and it is shaped like a heart or fashioned after a heart when you see the way it's laid out. One main with four rivers flowing out of it, the living waters of life. So let's have a look at a couple of scriptures here. Revelation chapter 22, verses one through two. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, clean and pure. Remember, he's coming for a bride who's clean and pure, spotless, coming from the throne of God and of the lamb. In the middle of its street on either side of the river, was the tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now below here where you can't see, I have some notes about some of those words that we just read and note the 12 kinds of fruit. We know there are 12 months in a year, but there's also 12 tribes of Israel who have finally produced the fruit that is pleasing to God by midpoint when the full number has been reached. Jesus said, understand the parable of the fig tree. And the parable of the fig tree is in all of the gospels, including John chapter one with the whole situation. I think it was Nathaniel who was under the fig tree and Jesus comments to him, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. So interesting stuff. Genesis chapter two, verses 10 through 14. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. And from there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It flows around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. The bdellium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. It flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. Revelation chapter four, verses three through six. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone. Now we'll go over this in more detail when we get to, to Revelation chapter four, but jasper represents quite a few interesting things. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Now think about the bow. Genesis calls it a bow. Genesis does not call it a rainbow. However, in the Old Testament, in another Bible verse, I think it was Ezekiel I showed you guys, where it's called a rainbow. And the word bow in, in, um, in the Old Testament the word bow can mean rainbow or a bow of an archer, et cetera, et cetera. So that's very interesting. There was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. And then emerald is the one that represents the tribe of Judah. Jesus Christ was of the tribe of Judah. King David was of the tribe of Judah. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. So you can see above in Revelation 22, it tells us what this clear as crystal body of water is. Something like a sea of glass that is before the throne. Because in Revelation 22, then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb and in the middle of its street. 
Okay. So first of all, it does not tell us the name of the main river, only the four that flow out of it. Word meanings for Genesis chapter two. So now if you guys want to have open on your end, the passage I just shared with you from Genesis two, that was Genesis chapter two, verses 10 through 14 to kind of follow along as I go over the words. All right. First of all, the word river means prosperity, sparkle, a symbol, flow together, shine, beam of light, radiant. What did Jesus say in Matthew 13 happens when he returns? His people will shine and be radiant, flowed to depart, to deliver, to lead out or appear. The word Eden means pleasure, delight, soft and pleasant. The word garden means fenced in bride protect and defend it's very interesting because in revelation um six when jesus is opening the seals and you'll get more on this later too when we get there the word seal is rooted in the word fenced in and also the word heart fenced in and heart so the word garden fenced in bride protect defend the word divided, separated, division, get separated, sever, scatter, separate oneself. And four, I just made a note of four. It's interesting that deliverance comes in the fourth year, which is midpoint in the tribulation. Kind of a mini picture there again, shining bright, radiant, deliverance, pleasure and delight, pleasant. We go back to how it was in the garden of Eden before the fall of man. It also references the bride and the seals there fenced in and the bride and talks about separation and division scattering. Well, what happens? You see the, um, the remnant, the exiles, Israel is scattered. They're scattered, but then in the midst of tribulation, the full number has been reached. All right. So, and we also have the separation and midpoint, you have the divorcement of the apostates. Those who refuse to repent or are thrown into the fire of God's wrath you can also review Matthew 13 about the tares being bundled up and thrown into the fire. And then of course, at midpoint, the deliverance occurs and the wrath of God begins. So now let's look at the name of the rivers, the land, the stones. So the first river, Pishon, means increase, spread about, grow fat to be scattered, to act proudly. So first we have being scattered and we have a spirit of pride. Havala, which is land a circle, a circular circuit, travail and labor, be in anguish, be pained, writhe, the dance, whirl about, bear, bring forth, wait anxiously to be born, suffering, suffering, torture, to be distressed. Notice it also mentioned where there is gold, which is a conductor of electricity. And I mentioned that earlier about to remember that about the gold. The next one is a stone, bdellium. It means to divide something in pieces, pearl. Divide, separate, select, sever, set apart, sever, withdraw from. So first we have scattering and pride. Next we have bearing, bringing forth during the midst of suffering. First half of tribulation. You know, the, the whole labor, um, people are getting saved all throughout the first half and repenting. Okay. Till the full number is reached at midpoint. All right. And waiting anxiously yearning for the return of Jesus Christ. Then we have bedellium. We have division taking place, separating. You have those who are set apart being separated. Remember Matthew 13, that the wheat will be gathered into his barn. Meanwhile, the tares will be bundled up and thrown into the fire of the wrath of God. Then you have onyx, meaning to blanch or make pale, probably barrel from its pale green color. 
Blanche means to grow pale from shock or fear. So you have great fear. Do you remember in Revelation chapter six, it talks about the sixth seal and the great fear that comes upon everybody. The sky rolls back, rolls up like a scroll. There's a great shaking. Now you have the word stone. The word stone means to build, rebuild and various other meanings. I thought it was worthy here to mention that stone means to rebuild. You have the rebuilding of the temple. Who are the stones? The Bible tells us clearly God's people are the stones of the temple. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Without him, the building cannot stand. You have no temple being rebuilt. So you have all of us who are stones of the temple. Jesus, who is the chief cornerstone, and you have the full number of God's people he has been waiting on, who have gotten saved, who have repented, have totally decided to make their robes white and clean and spotless. So stone to build, rebuild, and various other meanings. Gihon means to break forth in labor. Aha, finally, the temple has been rebuilt. People have been selected and separated. People have gone through great fear and longing for the return of Christ. The temple is rebuilt and they have burst forth in labor. The final full number has been sealed. Our seal is the Holy Spirit. So all of us sitting here right now are sealed already, but at midpoint, the full number is reached. It's not some process that happens all at once. It happens all throughout the first half of tribulation. And we went over that in the study of the churches too. So break forth in labor, burst forth, gush, bring forth to issue, take out. Cush is the name of a son of Ham, black and Israelite. Now it's in total darkness. The wrath of God, his people have been sealed. The full number has been met. Tigris, rapid, fast. Things begin to move quickly now. Assyria, successful, a step, advance, prosper, lead, to go straight, to lead on, to be led on, to be made happy, to be blessed, to relieve. God's people, on the other hand, are prosperous. They are leading. They are walking the straight path. They are successful. They are happy. They are blessed. They are relieved to be the heck out of everything that's going on on the earth and to finally be with the Lord and to be with their loved ones that they have been separated from all of this time. They're also at the same time leaders. They're also being led by Jesus Christ. Euphrates, fruitfulness to break forth, rushing. And it just so happens to be the largest and longest river of Western Asia. It rises from two chief sources in the Armenian mountains and flows into the Persian Gulf. We know there are two witnesses. I thought that was interesting. It rises from two chief sources because I don't believe anything is ever by accident when it comes to God. You think about the two witnesses. You think about the people leading during the end times, but fruitfulness break forth rushing. We just read about the fruit that is produced for the healing of the nations in Revelation chapter 22. The first verse in Revelation comes from the throne of God in the middle of its street, middle heart. Okay, we're going to look at that before you wonder what is she talking about. I'm going to show you what I mean. All right, so we're going to look and see what the word street means and consider this. How did God make humans? So can you guys see that screenshot there? Shake your head. Okay. It means to mold, shape, or fabricate form. Something from clay used of a potter. Interesting. God made humans out of the dust of the earth, clay. Okay. You can go do a word study in Genesis. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal coming from the throne of God and of the lamb in the middle of its street, 
On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Then I have another note, how did God create humans like a potter, red earth, clay, mold, shape, fabricate. The word street means exactly that. The tree of life, living water that flows from the very heart of God that we drink. Verse two, in the heart, middle of his people. Who's in the middle all the time in the book of Revelation? When we see Jesus, he's in the middle. Like in Revelation chapter seven, he's in the middle. And I believe in Revelation chapter one, he's standing in the middle and so on and so forth. And I think in Revelation chapter four, it's either four or five, no, in five, he's in the middle, in the middle of his people in all 12 tribes, every month yield its fruit. How many months in a year? 12. Interesting. Leaf means branches. Oh, and 12 tribes of Israel. Leaf means branches, tribes, people, producing, bearing, giving birth. So leaf means branches, tribes, people, producing, bearing, giving birth. So God's people producing the fruit are for the healing of the nations. Now, we were just reading about the potter and the clay and so on and so forth. And we were reading about God's people being for the healing of the nations. It says here in Revelation chapter two, verses 26 through 29, he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, until the end to him, I will give authority over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. As I also have received authority from my father and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. You see these people who are leaders, and we'll get into that more later too. During these end times, God always has leaders. He had Moses. We well, had Noah. He had Moses. Um, he had Aaron. He had Joshua. God always appoints leaders. Those seven spirits are his seven spirits that he also puts and to these leaders, you see Jesus in Revelation 5 is standing as a lamb as if slain. And he has seven horns. Horns represents power and strength. And he has seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all of the earth. So these seven spirits are sent out into the earth. And they are his specific spirits of those leaders the two witnesses, the seven stars, the seven leaders of the seven churches and the seven churches. All right. So I thought that was an interesting verse to note here, given we are talking about the clay and the rivers and the potter and the end times and all of that. All right. Matthew 26 verses 26 through 29. And this will conclude the end times arc study. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, or this is, yeah, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. So you see the blood, he said, drink, drink this. This is my blood. Now people thought he was crazy when he would say things like this, like he's telling us to eat his body and drink his blood, but he was speaking spiritually. So therefore in the same sense, I'm speaking spiritually in the Bible, those rivers of water of life represent the very heart of God and the chambers and the rivers represent the blood, the life giving blood of Jesus Christ of the Lord that gives us life. And so when we drink from the rivers of life, when we obey Jesus, when we walk in his ways, when we keep his commandments in our hearts, 
because he is the law and the lawgiver, Jesus Christ. When you walk in his ways and you walk in the truth and in the light of Jesus, and you know the truth, and you don't just sit around and listen to apostate teachings and believe everything you hear, but you listen to what the word of God says, and you worship him and magnify his name and serve him and love him. You're drinking his life giving waters given to us through the Holy Spirit, through Jesus, the Holy Spirit dwelling in our midst, in our hearts. Let me go ahead and stop the screen share real quick. When you become one with Christ, number one in the 10 commandments, there's a commandment that says that we are not to take the name of the Lord in vain. And I know I've gone over this with you before, but I'll just refresh your memories. Do you really think that the 10 commandments that are so important, it's going to be so shallow as just referring to don't say a certain word. No, it's much deeper than that, but the devil doesn't want you to know that when you marry somebody, you take their name. When a woman marries a man, she takes his name. And I believe I showed you the word meanings in another video or not another video, another teaching that we did. So it's to just accept Jesus Christ as your savior and not really mean it to continue living in the flesh, to continue living in sin, to continue practicing sin. Now, let me be clear. We will all sin and make mistakes. I sin and make mistakes. You all sin and make mistakes, but we can't practice sin. The Bible tells us that practicing, think about when you practice for something, you're doing it over and over and over and over again. So we must repent. So there's coming the hour now where it's like the final judgment here that we are in and we're in that very hour. And so the devil is really going to come at us hard. He's really going to come at us to make us slip, to make us fall. It's very important that if we slip and fall, we need to get right back up. Don't stay down. Okay. We know that there's coming the time and it's happening little by little right now. Men's hearts are being hardened. People are being turned over to a reprobate mind. So this is very serious stuff. So going back now to taking the name of the Lord in vain. You shall not take the name of the Lord, your God in vain. We must be serious about our relationship with the Lord and about serving him. Because if we're living like the world, or if we look like the world, we are taking the name of the Lord in vain. That is what that means. So you can't be practicing the sin or walking in the flesh. The Bible says no flesh can enter the kingdom of heaven. No flesh. Okay. Meaning we've got to put to death the flesh. And I know, and I know it's going to get harder according to what the Bible says. The devil is going to be putting some really good temptations in front of us. If he hasn't already, I mean, he does it to me. I get temptations and things that happen, you know, even recently, just different stuff. I mean, he's going to put stuff. He knows what your weaknesses are. He's, he's studied you your whole life. Even when you were in the womb, he has studied you. He knows what makes you stumble and he knows just how to bring you down. So all of us need to just get really close to the Lord, really trust in him. Now, if you make a mistake, don't beat yourself up. Fear God, be afraid to remain in that mistake enough to get out of it. You know, I mean, if you're standing outside and you see a tornado coming down your street, are you just going to stand there and say, come get me? No, you're going to run for shelter see sin as that tornado and run from it. Just like Joseph did when Potiphar's wife pursued him 
and began to try to throw herself at him to get him to have sexual relations with her. Joseph turned and he ran. So flee sin, run from the devil and run into the arms of God. Now, am I saying be afraid of the devil by running? No, we're not supposed to fear the devil. We resist him, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But you must resist him sometimes from by running away from his devices to make you stumble because they will be there and they will be very good ones. So fear God and God alone, rebuke the devil. Remember when you rebuke the devil, do not say, I rebuke you as the NAR church has taught you. The Bible tells us not to do that. In fact, somebody got the stuff beat out of them for doing that in the Bible. I think it's in the book of Acts. You say in the name of Jesus, leave me. If you want to call it by name, you have to, but I don't think it's rocket science people have tried to confuse it and make it that way or say the Lord Jesus Christ rebuke you. That's what you're to say. You have no, you and me are nothing. We can't command anything. We can't say, I command you who are the, they look at you and say, but who are you? All right. So now does anybody have any questions or comments? Because it is 759. So any questions or comments, please raise your hand. Oh, one of those nobody's talking to me times. I see how y'all are. All right. Well, I'm going to have to pick on people then. First of all, mommy, what do you, what is your comments or thoughts on everything? <laughs> um, well, it's a lot of stuff to cover, but anyway, I just had a thought on what you just said about, um, we don't have the authority to do the rebuking in our own name. It reminded me of what, um, who was it that, that the devil said he didn't know him. He said, he said, uh, Jesus, I know, but who are you or something like that? Do you remember that's the, the verse? That's the passage in acts. I was talking about, I don't know the exact chapter number, but yeah, the, the person, um, rebuked them saying, I command you or, or whatever. And the, and it said, Paul, I know Jesus. I know Paul, I know, but who are you? And then, yeah, the, that's, the, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. yeah. Then it proceeded to beat the ever loving daylights out of the person. They got their butt whooped. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. It's like, he would say, the devil would say the same to us. Like, who are you? You know? Well, yeah. And for evidence of that, we can all look in Jude where it talks about we're not supposed to do that. Even Michael, the archangel wasn't so bold and stupid and ignorant, and foolish to do such a thing, mm -hmm. you know? So, all right. Well, thank you for that input. Does anybody else have a question or a comment? Rudy, you look like you had something to say. I, I could swear. Um, you know, Ashley, um, you answered it. Um, I was just looking it up about where um, even Michael, the archangel, when there was a dispute over the burial of Moses body, and if even a heavenly um, being like an angel is not going to confront the devil and have a conversation, why should we? Exactly. Yeah, I had to do within the um, Moses, the, you know, about Moses's body being buried and even Michael, the archangel didn't rail at the devil. So that's important to remember. All right, let me pick on one more person. Let's see. Um, Chrissy, you look very like in deep thought, like you have something to say. Oh, no, I'm just in deep thought. I'm just thinking about everything. Do you have any comments or questions to add to the conversation? No, I just think it was a really very powerful lesson and there's a lot to you know, just process. And I think it was a great lesson. Well, thank you. I'm glad it blessed you. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll stop picking on people. Actually, I do have one question. Um, oh, go ahead. Yes. It, it was more of a thought. Um, I think maybe some of us may have heard about the seven month mandates that's taught in various circles. And when you was um, commenting on Revelation chapter two, verse 26 and 29, I was wondering in my mind how maybe some churches 
get up in this um, idea of um, the seven mountain mandate, um, the minion process and stuff like to take the minion over the earth and that we have the ability to control finances, government, health, and et cetera. And I was just, um, just wondering, curious about what's your take on that, just by the way. Oh, well, I've done extensive videos and stuff on that whole thing. The seven mountain mandate, the, I believe wholeheartedly that that is the seven mountains. I know many people think it's Rome, but you see the harlot is also mixed with Rome very much. So, so, um, it's the NAR movement and those seven mountains, the seven mountain mandate. If you go look it up, it, it takes in the whole entire beast system. So they want to control See, we, as I say all the time, I'm trying to be as clear as I can here, because it's kind of a big question, but we aren't supposed to meddle in the world B system because it belongs to the devil only because God has given him dominion over it. He's called the God of the world. God gave him dominion because of the fall of man over the world system. That's why it's so evil until Jesus Christ returns and Jesus Christ comes and he establishes the kingdom. But you see, the NAR movement, they want to own all these mountains, meaning every aspect of the beast system. And they believe they have to usher in the return of Jesus, which fits another thing I'm going to share with you eventually about the mark of the beast and their involvement in that. So they have to usher in the return of Jesus and they have to establish the kingdom for God, for Jesus on this earth. And so it's all aspects of the beast system. And it's very important to know these things because everybody's looking at the world in relation to um, looking for the antichrist. The antichrist comes from the church. The antichrist, the, the, the great apostasy, the second beast, all of these things come from the church. Is it going to come from a church that looks like it's not Christian? Like, is it going to come from a Muslim church? No. How's that going to deceive Christians? Are you going to be deceived by Muslim antichrist? No. Is it going to come from the, a Catholic church? Are you all going to be deceived by Catholics? No. Are you going to be deceived by a Pope? No. The, that's what the devil wants us to look at. That's why they're so in our face. That's why the headlines scream titles that seem to fulfill prophecy. It's in our face. Every quit looking at everything that is obvious. Okay. So is it going to come from something that looks like, what is it going to come from Buddha Buddhism? Is that going to deceive any guys going to be deceived by Buddhist homosexuals and anything? No, it's going to come from something that looks like too true, not too true Christianity. And in fact, it's so deceiving that even the people who are predestined, the remnant, Paul tells us they're predestined, by the way, even those people who can't be deceived, if it wasn't for the fact they were predestined, would be deceived, possibly because this is just so deceiving. Once I tell you what the mark of the beast is and things like that and tell you what I found in the Bible about all that, and you're going to have to have a really open mind and don't lift up teachers and put them on the same pedestal as Jesus. And remember the people who taught us Bible prophecy are now part of the apostasy. The, the Antichrist comes from the great apostasy who has taught us Bible prophecy. I'm just going to share with you when I go over it, what the Bible actually says. We're not going to put my opinion in it. We're not going to put your opinion or anybody else's, nor am I going to piggyback off anybody else's teachings. I'm going to show you what it says. You can study it and pray about it when I tell you, but you're going to see that this is so deceiving. That if I don't tell you very well, unless the Lord opens your eyes and shows you this too, if I do not tell you, you're going to be deceived. It's that deceiving. Possibly, unless God tells you somehow. It's really deceiving. Bad. All right. So that being said, I hope I helped answer your question, Rudy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> God bless you. So let's go ahead and say a prayer for everybody who wants to make sure you're muted while we pray. So we don't get like 
breathing noises or background noises, anything weird. All right. Father God, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this time together. Thank you for blessing us, Lord. Thank you for forgiving us of all of our sins, Father. And just thank you for those of us maybe who are stuck in something or, or we have bondages, Father, that we know are wrong, Lord, but we're just feel trapped in it or, or there just seems to be no way out, Lord. Or we just don't have the strength, Lord. I just pray that you just begin to to free us from those situations and deliver us from them, Lord, and give us strength to overcome. Lord, during this time, Lord, just give us strength to overcome the various trials and tribulations, Lord, and the arrows of the enemy that he's throwing our way, Father. He's not going to throw things at us necessarily that are just plain easy. He's going to be hitting us hard. Lord, it says so in your word. We know that this is a difficult time. He's going to come at us with things that are difficult, Lord, things that hit our emotions and our hearts, Lord, things that are going to be hard to recognize that are just things of the enemy, vices of the enemy, Father. And maybe in some cases, they'll be easy to recognize, but it may be something that's very, very hard. He'll come at us with our weakness. He'll come at the men with their weaknesses, whatever their weaknesses are, Lord, whether it's a pornography or, or lust of some sort, Father, or a strange woman or, or just anything, Father. Lord, he'll come at us women with things, similar things, Lord. Similar things. Maybe he'll hit us with our past and our mistakes and our regrets and things that we can't go back and change or a painful situation in our lives, Lord, that we can't fix on our own. Lord, let us be prepared. Let us be firm, firmly rooted in the truth of Jesus Christ, grounded and rooted, Father, and ready. So when the storm comes, Lord, our house will be solid and firm and will not be taken out by the storm. Or just like when people, I think of people down south, when they know a hurricane's coming, they start boarding up everything, making preparations for the storm. They do what they can get necessary supplies and all sorts of things, Father. They don't, I'm sure maybe there's some who do, I don't know. But overall, Lord, they don't just sit there and say, all right, come get me. They prepare. Lord, let us be prepared spiritually. Let's not focus on physical preparedness because this is a spiritual storm. Lord, we know according to your word, you're going to take care of us and provide for us. Let us place more emphasis on spiritual preparedness, spiritual preparedness, Lord, because you know what? If we die, we get to go home with you, Father. If we are spiritually ready and prepared and we have washed our robes and made them white and clean, the Lord... We can have tons of food and supplies and die and go to hell and spend an eternity in the lake of fire. So, Father, I just thank you and praise you. Get us prepared. Get us strong. Make us like strong towers, Lord, in the midst of the storm with the waves crashing against us that don't shake us. They don't knock us down, Lord. They don't make us lose the place in which we're standing because we're standing firmly on you and your word and on your on your commandments lord and the truth of jesus christ and your spirit and in obedience and repentance just thank you and praise you in jesus name amen all right amen god bless all of you and i hope that you all have a lovely lovely evening and a lovely rest of the day.